Hey guys, to try and find the best body fat scale, I spent 12 weeks weighing myself with some of the most popular eight electrode scales from Hume Health, Our Belief, Omron, Renfo, Tanita, and Withings. I weighed friends and family, I had a DEXA scan, and I even trained one of my arms in the gym to see if the scales would notice a muscle imbalance. For consistency, I weighed myself first thing in the morning in the same clothing and following the best practices outlined in the user manuals. While the four electrode scales can only send a current through your lower body, the handles allow a current to pass through your upper body as well, meaning a more precise measurement. For most people, these devices are used to measure body fat, muscle mass, and to track changes in body composition over time. You're about to see four graphs, which will show what each of them reported for key metrics, starting with weight. I appreciate some people work in pounds, and I've added that on the right-hand side. Over the 12 weeks, I was deliberately trying to put on weight, and thankfully the scales are all aligned here, agreeing that I put on roughly two kilograms, four and a half pounds across the 12 weeks. Next is probably the metric most people look for, which is body fat percentage. There's much more of a spread here, as well as a lot of noise in some of the graphs, which I'll explain later. Uh, Tanita reported the lowest body fat of around nine or 10%, while our belief was the highest at 14%. The current they send through your body measures bone, fat, and everything else. So total muscle mass is just your weight minus what it detects to be bone and fat. You can see I gained muscle over the 12 weeks. Everything is trending upwards. And since Tanita had the lowest fat, it therefore reports the highest muscle, while our belief now has the lowest muscle alongside Renfo. You may have noticed one absentee already. The Omron scales are very limited. The only muscle value they offer is skeletal muscle mass, which is what most people think of when you say muscle, and it excludes some of these smooth muscles around your organs. As I said, they can't measure skeletal muscle mass directly, so they use a formula to estimate it. For example, Renfo appears to use 61% of total muscle mass, and for our belief in Runstar, it's 68%. What that means is you're better off focusing on total muscle mass or using something called appendicular lean mass, which is the total muscle mass in your arms and legs. The reason that's more reliable is because there are no organs in your arms and legs. So everything that isn't bone and fat is likely to be muscle. If we switch back to total muscle mass, you can see some quite big spikes and dips in some of the data. And a lot of that can be explained by hydration. Hydration is probably the biggest reason for noisy data, and it can be seen most clearly in Tanita's results. It's not quite as simple as how much water you've been drinking, the amount of salt in your diet, as well as carbohydrate intake, can both influence water retention. If we first isolate Tanita's total body water percentage across the 12 weeks, then above it plot the total muscle mass reported, you can hopefully see they tend to move up and down at the same time. That's because the more hydrated you are, the more muscle these scales believe you have. The correlation here is relatively strong, but I did intentionally gain muscle over time, which slightly throws off the relationship. If we instead look at body fat percentage, there's an inverse relationship. So now the more hydrated you are, the less fat it believes you have. And in this case, the correlation is almost perfect. If you wanted to correct for this, you'd ideally take back-to-back -back measurements when your true body composition hasn't changed, but your hydration has. But even with my weight gain, the relationship is really obvious and 1% extra body water results in 1% lower body fat. One of my experiments was to deliberately hydrate myself and dehydrate myself in consecutive weigh-ins, and I found that only the Tanita, Hume Health, and Withings devices pick this up. If I show you the total body water graph, you can see how those three are quite erratic, while the others remain very stable. The fact that it's the three cheaper scales which don't move around makes me trust the ones that do, even if it is inconvenient to have your numbers jumping up and down every time you weigh in. Next, we're going to look at some measurements that aren't available for four electrode scales, and that is the ability to estimate your muscle and fat content in your arms and legs. Since it's quite a lot of information, most of the apps report this with a nice visual, often alongside reference ranges. That helps because telling me my arm has three and a half kilos of muscle is pretty meaningless on its own. So you're able to see whether you're high or low for your age and sex. For me, these values moved up across the weeks. However, with only our belief reporting more than one decimal place, it took a while to see any consistent change. Comparing across devices, some of the other users I measured had a difference of several kilograms in both muscle and fat for a single leg. To see how reliably they detect changes, I spent six of the 12 weeks doing bicep, tricep, and forearm exercises almost exclusively with my left arm. 
I did panic when I realized that adding 100 grams of muscle in a single arm is quite substantial. But as you can see by my DEXA results, I just about managed it. And my left arm now has 108 grams more muscle than my right. If you graph the difference between my arms, most of the scales reported more muscle in my left arm around the time of the scan, though Withings went a bit rogue and favored my right arm on the day itself. And as you can see, our belief is completely off. So to see how the raw numbers compare to the gold standard, that brings me on nicely to the full DEXA scan results. While comparing all the scales with each other does give you some insight, what you really need is a source of truth. In week 11, I had a DEXA scan, said to be the gold standard for body composition. To smooth out the hydration spikes, I compared it to an average of three readings, including directly before and after the scan. Starting with my main results, total muscle mass was 59.5 kilograms, and every scale underestimated that, with Tanita being the closest. Next is the total muscle in both arms and legs, known as appendicular lean mass, and everyone except our belief was quite close here. Body fat from Tanita was almost spot on, while the others were too high, and the opposite problem with bone mass, with Renfo in particular, being over one kilogram too high. A lot of the other people I measured were interested in their visceral fat, but again, this can't be measured directly, and the company seemed to acknowledge this, as it's often reported as a score. The scores have different ranges, but they all considered me either in the lower half of normal range, or within the optimal range if they had one, which aligns with DEXA. For the segmental analysis, they were relatively close to the true values. Hume Health's body pod was too low for my arm muscle, but almost perfect on the legs, while Renfo was too high for leg fat. The trunk is another area where it comes down to a formula and maybe some population reference ranges, so it's not going to be as accurate for an individual user. Again, that's another reason to focus more on the readings for the arms and legs rather than the torso. One way these devices try to nudge the values in the right direction is by using a different formula for a certain group of users with an option known as athlete mode. Some of the reported measurements use data from the general population as a reference, but doing so means they end up overestimating body fat in an athletic population, which is why they've introduced athlete mode. This is a way to improve the accuracy by confirming you meet a certain threshold for physical activity, which differs by device. Overall, three of the six offer an athlete mode, but as you may have seen on the graphs, I only had it enabled for Tanita. In hindsight, that was probably biased, and I should have either chosen to have them all enabled or none at all. I qualified myself as an athlete for Tanita under the lifetime of fitness definition, as I've been exercising regularly for the last 20 years, even if my current training hours aren't that high. I did measure with athlete mode switched on and off, and turning it off for Tanita would have seen my body fat rise by around 3%, while turning it on for Withings would have seen it come down by around 3.5%, taking me below DEXA for body fat. Seven of my other users were non-athletes, and Tanita consistently reported higher body fat by an average of 5%. Unfortunately, I have no DEXA scan results for these users, so I can't comment on which of these readings to trust. Okay, with all of that said, what you really want to know is which scale is the best. Now, I should point out that what I would keep for myself and what I'd recommend to others are not necessarily going to be the same thing. However, I can immediately rule out the Omron BF511s for several reasons. Body fat percentage was too high. Despite having a handle, it doesn't offer segmental analysis. There's no app for this model, and it doesn't offer total muscle mass or bone mass. I'm also happy to rule out the R belief. While the extra decimal place was helpful, the overall accuracy just isn't there. It wrongly reported 300 grams more muscle in my right arm, and up to a 700 gram difference between left and right arms when I measured other users, uh, while also being off when compared to DEXA. If I'm being critical, then the Renfo Morpho scan is next to go. It did have the nicest handle, and I like the design, but the main problem I had with it was being so different on bone mass. It seems minor, but assigning too much bone mass means it's going to be off on either muscle, fat, or both. For all 10 users, it reported the highest bone mass, around one kilogram more than the others, and 1.2 kilos, more than two and a half pounds, more than my DEXA. The final three are all potentially good purchases, and choosing between them comes down to personal preference, so I'm going to give you the pros and cons of each. The Hume Health Body Pod is the most user-friendly of the three. The app is very easy to navigate, and I can plot daily, weekly, or monthly trends for any metric. It picked up the differences in arm muscle quite clearly, and it shadows the Withings readings nicely when measuring other users. 
Compared to a DEXA scan, it did underreport arm muscle, but was almost perfect on leg muscle. My biggest criticism is probably the handle. It doesn't have separate electrodes for the thumbs, and it's a bit on the thin side. As with the other two, you also have to contend with some noise depending on hydration. The Tanita BC545N was the closest to my true body fat, though you can argue that athlete mode gives it an unfair advantage. As you saw in the non-athlete population, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the most accurate for everyone else. What you really want to look for is that everything trends in the direction you expect, and indeed, I saw it more consistently favor my left arm muscle mass as the weeks went on. I feel the scale's age counts against it, there's no app for this particular model, and as they've been around since 2012, it doesn't feel like a very premium experience. If you're willing to put up with regular fluctuations in muscle and fat, then I feel confident they'll at least be directionally relevant over time. At twice the price of the others, I personally don't consider the Withings body scan to be value for money. The Withings app is quite hard to navigate, and it was only in week eight that I even found that it had an athlete mode. It's of a similar accuracy to Tanita and the body pod, and I'm not interested in some of the medical grade features that set it apart from its competitors. Its most premium feature is the ability to perform a six lead ECG, which would be useful in detecting atrial fibrillation. While AFib does increase the lifetime risk of heart failure and stroke, it is relatively rare in anyone under the age of 55. If you are over 55 or have additional risk factors like obesity or high blood pressure, or if you do a very high volume of endurance training, detecting AFib could be of a much higher value to you. They were also the only device to have issues collecting my data, and out of 24 measurements, I probably had to redo around six of them because the body composition failed to record. Overall, I'd say the remaining three scales are all capable of tracking meaningful changes in body composition over time, and they'll generally stay within a few percentage points of the true values for muscle and body fat. Having previously reviewed the best four electrode scales, stepping up to eight electrodes definitely feels like a genuine improvement in accuracy and having the arm and leg measurements gives you an added level of depth when assessing your own body composition. I hope you found this video useful. It's been one of the more exhausting data collections I've had to do. I've learned a lot about the strengths and limitations of eight electrode scales, as well as which of the metrics they report are likely to be the most or least accurate. Thanks for watching.